Hi, and welcome to another session of Introductory Statistics. In this particular session, we're going to talk about the normal distribution. And we've already talked a little bit about the normal distribution back in Chapter 2. Remember the empirical rule and the nice, normal, bell-shaped curve that was perfectly symmetrical and all the stuff that we could do with the empirical rule because of that. We're going to talk about that again in this chapter, but we're going to go a lot further now that we have two chapters of probability behind us and we understand a lot more about probability. Uh, be ready, as always, with your formula card, your calculator, and your lecture notes for this chapter. But also, there is where you find your lecture notes in D2L. Uh, under the content. You can also find this document. It's called Draw Me a Picture and it's, it also has normal CDF and inverse norm in the name to help you know when to use which calculator function and what to plug into those functions to help you get the answer. So uh, we'll talk in detail about this and we will use this document as we go through this video. So be sure to have all four of those things ready. If you want to pause now to grab that document and print it, you can. Uh, we'll just go ahead and talk about the normal distribution. So as a refresher, remember that the normal distribution was this nice, perfectly bell-shaped curve that we had. It could have any mean, uh, not just zero. Three of our distributions here have a mean of zero. The mean is represented by the population mean mu. It's represented by the Greek letter mu. Um, and that's how we say it. It's M-U, if you're going to spell it out in, in our letters. Um, but the Greek letter is this. And I think it looks like a cursive M, but most students say they think it looks like a cursive U. Um, either way is fine, as long as it looks sort of like that. Uh, and then the sigma is the population standard deviation. This is lowercase sigma. It's different from that capital sigma that we used to add everything up. Um, when it's lowercase, it means the population standard deviation. So here we see that that we have um, three means that are centered at zero, um, and you can see that the normal distribution is centered. I didn't draw a very good line there, but you can see that it's centered at zero when it has a mean of zero, and then of course this distribution is centered at negative two because it has a mean of negative two. Um, and then the standard deviation tells us how spread out things are. You can see that the larger standard deviation, well the squared standard deviation, um, but uh, it, it would still have a larger standard deviation uh, of five is much more spread out than the standard deviation squared of 0.2. Um, 0.2 is much narrower. Uh, and so the wider it is, the larger the standard deviation and the larger the squared standard deviation here in this case. Uh, so that's the normal distribution. And remember that when we did the normal distribution back in chapter two, we talked about the empirical rule. Uh, and we said that 68% of data values were within one standard deviation of the mean. That means going one standard deviation on one side and one standard deviation on the other. So one standard deviation to the left and one standard deviation to the right. And then uh, if we wanted to go two standard deviations to the right and two standard deviations to the left, that was going to contain 95% of our data. And then if we wanted to go three standard deviations in chapter uh, three standard deviations to the left and to the right. In chapter two, we said all or nearly all, but in this chapter we become a little bit more precise and we say 99.7%. Um, and that really is all or nearly all, because if you have a thousand data values, which is a huge data set, only three of them wouldn't be within three standard deviations, is what this is saying. Um, so that is a huge amount there. And then we also, I believe, talked about in chapter two, if not then, now, we will talk about how to practically apply this. So here we have uh, women have uh, an average height, we're told here, of 65 inches with a standard deviation of three and a half inches. Sometimes I see different numbers for these, but they're all pretty close to the same. Uh, but here we're going to assume the average height is 65 inches and a standard deviation of three and a half inches. So if we were to apply the 68% rule here, uh, again, mean minus one standard deviation is going to be the lowest value. Um, so here we have our mean and one standard deviation. And if we subtract, we get 61 and a half. And then if we add one standard deviation, we would get 68 and a half. And remember 95% with, went with two standard deviations 
to the left and to the right. And so here we have two standard deviations. And when we multiply two times three and a half, we get seven. So if we subtract seven, we would get 58. If we add seven, we would get 72. And then three standard deviations goes with a 99.7%. Three standard deviations to the left and three standard deviations to the right. And three standard deviations ends up here being, because we have three and a half, 10 and a half total. Um, so we will take our mean and we will subtract three standard deviations to get 54 and a half, then we will add three standard deviations to get 77 and a half. So now we know an enormous amount about women. We know that 68% of women will be between 61 and a half inches. Um, I don't think my daughter's quite that tall yet, uh, or will ever be, because I think she's probably stopped growing. So she's not in the 68th percentile. I am, and I consider myself pretty short. Um, uh, I'm 62, 62 and a half, maybe even 63 sometimes, but it's probably somewhere between 62 and 62 and a half. And then uh, to 68 and a half, and I consider that pretty tall, probably because I'm short. Um, but what we wouldn't be able to answer with this information, with the empirical rule, is something like what percentage of women are less than 69 inches tall. If that had said 68 and a half, we could have done it. Um, but let's see, 69 inches tall would be right here. Um, we'll say, uh, well, no, let's, let's say that's 68 and a half inches tall. Maybe I should draw it right here. Let's say um, that's 68 and a half inches tall. And then we'll say right here, this is 61 and a half inches tall. And so we know that this, um, I can't write very well. Um, we know that this is 68% of our data. And then we know we have 32% left because the whole thing has to sum up to be 100%. 32% um, left is on this side and on this side. So we have to split it in two. So there would be 16% for this side. And if we add 16 and 68 together, we would get 84%, but that's only for less than 68 and a half inches tall. Um, that's not 69. We think that it's probably pretty close. It'll be just a smidge more than the 84%, um, but that is, again, that's for 68.5. We don't know exactly what it's going to be for 69, but we will by the end of this video. We'll come back to this at the end of the video. Uh, so some principles about z-scores. We've talked about the z-scores back in chapter 2 as well. Uh, remember that the z-score is the number of standard deviations uh, that you are, that your data value is, um, and we use x to represent data values, from the mean. So um, this b in data value is above the mean, and a is below the mean. Uh, negative z-scores are below the mean because of the way that we will say um, a minus mu, and if a is less than mu, that's going to give us a negative answer. Um, but if we say b minus mu, b is more than mu, so that'll give us a positive answer. Um, and then a will have a larger absolute value because a is further from the mean. Um, so here, this would have a negative value, which makes sense because it would be below zero, and b would have a positive z-score value because it's above zero. Uh, so hopefully that makes sense as we transition from normal distributions to what we call the standard normal curve. Any, anytime you have a distribution of z-scores and not raw data values, um, the z-scores are called the standard normal curve. And continuing with that, the mean of all z-scores is always zero and the standard deviation of all z-scores is always one. And we see that true here on the standard normal curve picture um, that we have a mean of zero and then a standard deviation of one means that when we go out three standard deviations to the left and three standard deviations to the right we should have all or nearly all of our data and we do in this picture um, and that really means that any z-scores that are less than negative three and any z-scores that are more than positive three are considered outliers because all or nearly all of our data should be between negative three and positive three according to the empirical rule. And that's actually another way of defining outliers. Um, if you have a normal distribution and your z-score is less than negative three or more than positive three, that's considered an outlier. We can take any normal distribution and convert it to a standard normal distribution by applying our z-score formula. And by the way, the z-score formula whoops, is um, on chapter 2 of the formula card, and so I didn't write it again here, so just go to chapter 2 to get the z-score formula. Um, you will have that need to use that a good bit in the homework and the quizzes, um, but 
remember that it's just under chapter two. So you can take the orange distribution or the blue distribution or the green distribution and convert them all because they all have different means and different standard deviations here. You can convert them all to the standard normal distribution using the z-score formula. Okay, so in this slide, we're going to start talking about how to uh, attack actual problems. Um, and really, z-score, you will have some z-score questions, like the, the stuff that we've already looked at as well, but these are the more challenging problems, the ones that students struggle with. So what I've done is give us a three-step approach to solving these problems. And the Draw Me a Picture document that you've printed off along with your lecture notes and your formula card and your calculator, that's going to help us enormously because that's going to be step one, uh, is to draw the curve. Um, and step two, we're going to write on top of those uh, that document that you've done. That document has uh, at least a dozen of these, and we're going to do at least a dozen problems with them. And uh, if you need to do more, you just print another. Uh, and so, and then what we label and shade on here is going to tell us which calculator function to use and what the inputs are for almost all of the inputs. So we're set up once we've drawn the curve and we've labeled and shaded. And step two helps us confirm what we get in the calculator to see if it makes sense as well. So this is just a really nice process um, and really tremendously helpful for doing these types of problems. Uh, so, first, let's talk about what you have on your Draw Me a Picture document. Um, and this is, of course, zoomed into just one. You have um, maybe maybe a dozen on each side, but uh, certainly a whole bunch on each side. Nine. Well, wait, it would be an even number. So maybe um, six or eight, um, if not a dozen on each side. Uh, and you've got... Um, the normal curve drawn, and I've done a really thick line here, and I'll mention that in a minute, why, why I tried to do it, a really thick line. Here we think of this line, um, this really thick line, horizontal line, as a belt. Um, and then we label the mean in the very center, and really my picture might not be very centered, um, but the mean is supposed to be in the very center. And then Negative infinity and positive infinity. Infinity is a number larger than any, it's a concept, not really a number, but it represents a number that's larger than any possible number could be. Uh, so this is not really negative infinity. Um, if we were to draw negative infinity, it would be off the page, and it would be off of any page we could ever possibly draw. It would be outside of the universe, and really, because it goes forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, and so we can't represent negative infinity on our paper um, accurately, but we just say we'll use this to represent negative infinity even though we know it's not. And our calculator doesn't have infinity um, or negative infinity as an option, and so what we're going to do is we're going to put in one of the largest numbers that our calculator can possibly handle. Newton recommends doing 5,000 and negative 5,000, but then if you go and your mean is a salary, and I think it actually does one of those examples, it's like, oh no, psych, in this example, you're not going to use negative 5,000 and positive 5,000 for the mean. You're going to use negative uh, a million and positive a million. And so um, I don't like that. I like to use numbers that are so... Um, negative infinity and close to negative infinity and positive infinity that we'll never need to use anything different. You can always consistently use negative 1899 and positive 1899. Uh, let me show you what these actually mean because this is really scientific notation. What is What this is saying is it's saying when it says 1e2, um, then saying 1, the e becomes times 10 to the power of, um, and then the 2 is the, the power of the 10. So this is saying 1 times 10 to the power of 2. Uh, so uh, let's go ahead and discard. When I do 1 e, my e is actually two e's, it's second and comma, but you see that um, it just writes 1 e on the screen when I do that. So second and comma is how I got that. And then I'm just going to do 2 to start with. Um, and that gives me two zeros, which is really nice because it's a nice way of remembering if I have uh, E2, that's two zeros. And then if I did um, E4, I would get four zeros. Let's do E6. 
and then I get six zeros, and that happens to be a million. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, and let me do one more, um, the ninth. That would actually be a billion. So we would put a comma here, and a comma here, and a comma here, and that would make it easier to see that this is a billion. If we happen to do 15th, that would be a trillion, and if we happen to do no, 12th, that would be a trillion, and 15th would be a quadrillion. And so you can see that 1899, um, a trillion is just ridiculously large, and a quadrillion is, is even more than ridiculously large. Um, so you can tell that 1899 is going to be far, 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 far more than a quadrillion, so uh, certainly larger than any number we would ever need to use. Uh, and then if you're doing the negative key, be sure to do this negative key, because this is the minus key, and your calculator does not like you saying minus stuff um, and if it's a negative, it'll, it'll get mad at you. Uh, so be sure to keep those two separated. So we're going to use this, we're going to tell what our mean is, that will almost always be given to us in the problem, and then we're going to tell other stuff. So we may be given data values, and we'll label the data values on this line down here with the mean. We may be given area of the curve, um, and this is area of the curve, so uh, we would label it and shade the area of the curve that we were talking about up here, and we might do shading like this um, to represent that this is shading. The area of the whole curve, area corresponds to probability. So the area of the curve is always going to be between 0 and 1. Here, if we have more than half of the curve shaded, then we would expect the area to be more than half. Um, so it's the proportion of the curve that's shaded, which equals probability. So if we're requesting probability, that's going to be equal to the area of the curve. If you're requesting percentage, you would just take that probability and multiply it by 100%. Um, so if we're trying to find inverse norm, stuff that's labeled down here on the bottom, uh, then we would use inverse norm to find it. If we're trying to find area of the curve that's labeled up here on the top, then we would use normal CDF. And to drive this point home, I think of, of this line right here as a belt. Um, and so let me show you. Um, let's say that's our belt right here. Um, this line is our belt. Uh, and we can, I try to remember which one's which because you won't actually have your draw me a picture document on the exam. You will have your formula card and your formula card has these inputs on there but it doesn't have the whole picture. So I try to remember which is which and when to use which by normal CDF. Um, normal boxing rules say that you can strike above the belt and that is acceptable. So normal boxing rules above. So all of the orange stuff is above our belt, right? Um, remember, this is our belt. Um, so that's our belt right there. And so normal boxing rules is everything above the belt. The opposite of normal, and inverse means opposite, the opposite of normal boxing rules is striking below the belt. Um, and so all of this stuff in blue is below the belt, stuff that gets labeled below the belt. So if we, what we want to find is below the belt, then we should be using the inverse norm function. If what we want to find, on the other hand, is above the belt, then we should use normal CDF function. So what do we label above the belt? Well, this is an area. So we talk about area of the curve or area under the curve. And area equals probability. Um, and uh, we can convert from area to percentage by uh, multiplying by 100%. So anytime you're asked for area of the curve, the probability of the curve, the percentage of the curve, um, you can even be asked for like percentile, um, which sometimes percentile is above and sometimes it's below. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but if you're asked for actual data values or actual z-scores, then that's something that you're going to label below the belt. If you were doing a z-score, your mean would be zero, um, and you could just do inverse norm with a mean of zero. Uh, but if you were doing data values, then you should use uh, the mean that you're told in the problem, mu.
and then try to use inverse norm to find those actual data values. So um, if you're doing z-scores, your mean here would be 0 and your standard deviation would be 1, and you would just plug in area to the left. But if you're trying to find actual data values, then plug in the real mean that you're given in the problem and the real standard deviation that you're given in the problem. The same would be true of normal CDF. If you um, labeled z-scores on here instead of you would just do the minimum z-score and the maximum z-score, and then your mean of your z-scores and your standard deviation of your z-scores would be put in here. But if you're using data values instead of z-scores, then be sure to put in the real mean and the real standard deviation. So basically what I'm saying is all this stuff has to match up. Um, we'll do some examples. Uh, so again, we're going to start with this, and we're going to label and shade everything uh, that we are given in the problem, and then we're going to decide which calculator function to use and what inputs to plug in, and we're going to bring up our calculator and do that, and that should get us set. So here is an actual question. Uh, we're going to do three questions using this scenario. We're going to assume that we have some exam scores. These exam scores are normally distributed for us, which is important. We need that to be true to be able to do all of this stuff. And the mean of these exam scores is 77.5 with a standard deviation of 11.5. What percentage of students scored an A? And of course, we're going to assume that this is for a college exam. And so almost all college classes define an A as 90% or more. Um, so we want to know what percentage of students scored 90 or more on their exam. That's essentially what this is asking. So we get our document, and we look at our drawing. And we're like, okay, what's the mean? And what um, other values do we know on here that we can label? And what would we shade? Uh, so our mean, we were told is 77 and a half. And we were also told that we wanted an A, the percentage of those earning an A. So then ask yourself, um, earning an A, would that be shading to the left or would that be shading to the right? Hopefully you said right because you need 90 or more to earn an A, and so boom, we've shaded to the right. And now we want to know the percentage, what percentage this is. Um, if we do normal CDF, that'll give us area. Area is equal to probability. We need to multiply by 100% to convert that to percentage. And so we are multiplying by 100% here to convert that to percentage, and then normal CDF will give us the area. Um, the minimum of the shaded region is the first input. So this is the shaded region. It, I did a triangle here to approximate the shaded region. Um, and so 90% is the minimum of the shaded region. The maximum of the shaded region is this um, positive, but we don't have to put positive. It'll assume positive for us. 1E99. E and so uh, we will need to put 1E99 e in. And then uh, our mean, that's labeled here as well, 77 and a half. The only thing that's not labeled on the picture, and I, I don't label it because I don't think it needs to be labeled, is the standard deviation. But that was given to us in the problem as 11 and a half. And so our picture, once we've labeled and shaded it, told us to use normal CDF because it was above the belt. Um, it told us what the minimum and the maximum were and what the mean was. So it's told us almost everything that we need to do by the picture. Also, looking at the picture, we know that this should be less than 50%. Um, and if my picture is drawn to scale, it's probably going to be less than 25%. Because, um, But I don't know that my picture is drawn to scale. Let's see, 11 and a half standard deviations. Yeah, I would say it's, it's probably pretty good, but not. I wouldn't count on it being accurate. So um, now we will, I'm just going to go ahead and discard because the important stuff was all written right here. Um, so I'm going to do 100 um, times, I'm not going to do percentage, I don't think I even have a percent key on here, but maybe I do, um, but I'm not going to do the percentage symbol. So second DISTR, um, DISTR is right here, or second VARS, um, and that's written on your formula card too. Uh, so the, the fact that you need to go to second and DISTR to get to these functions. Uh, and then we want option two, normal CDF. CDF is option two. We don't ever use normal PDF. Um, we will use, by oh, we already have used in chapter four, binome PDF and binome CDF, but we never use normal 
P. So option two, um, I want 90 as my minimum and positive one, so one, and the E is second comma, and then nine nine. You know you have the right E, the correct E, I guess I should say, if it's shorter, and you might want to remember that by Ellen, because um, Ellen is shorter than the rest of the people. Uh, so one E nine nine, uh, the, the E is shorter than the numbers. And so you know you've gotten the right E if it's shorter. Uh, it will give you an, the wrong answer. Uh, so if you use alpha E, which would be the green E right here, it's probably going to give you zero. And uh, so depending on what the other inputs are, um, I don't think it'll give you an error most of the time, but it'll just give you the wrong answer. And so uh, you definitely want to be careful uh, to get the correct E right here, which is second comma. 77.5 for the mean and 11.5 for the standard deviation. And then all together, that's 13.85%. So that was less than a quarter. Um, and it was certainly less than half. I was sure it was going to be less than half, but it's even less than a quarter. And so that makes sense And with our picture. And uh, that's the first, the first problem. Now let's jump to a new one. For this one, we have exactly the same scenario as we had before, but this time we want to know what percentage of students scored a D. Um, and so a D, again, we're assuming a college course, uh, that's going to be between 60 and 70 percent. And so as we go to draw our picture, we should expect to have the same mu, um, but now we're going to have 60 and 70, and we're going to shade between. And then we want to find out the percentage here, and so that would be which calculator function? Hopefully you said normal CDF. Um, and because it's percentage still, we want to multiply by 100%. Uh, so let's go ahead and quickly do that. Um, I'm just going to do a second entry, and we'll change, whoops, went further than I meant to, 60, and then 70, and I'm going to delete because I have extra here and then 77 and a half and 11 and a half that all looks good um, so now we have 19.3 percent is going to be our area here and that makes sense it would certainly be less than 50 percent uh, 19.3 percent looks pretty good and then our third problem with this scenario is a little bit different than the first two. We want to know what the 90th percentile is. Uh, and you'll see this a whole lot in this chapter. Sometimes it will say, um, I got a score of 62.4. What percentile is that? And that's a different, quite a very different question. Um, and, but this one says, I'm at the 90th percentile. What's my exam score? Um, so uh, here it's actually looking for the exam score. I know that I'm going to have 77.5% here, um, and then I know that I'm going to look for um, the exam score, whatever that value is, uh, and so I would expect it to be more. This is the 50th percentile, and so the 90th percentile, I would expect it to be higher, because if you think back to those standardized test scores that you took, you'll remember that when you scored 90 percentile, that mean that means that 90 percent of students scored less than you, and only 10 percent of students scored more than you. So that's a really good score when you're the 90th percentile. So um, I actually drew it a little bit over here, um, but this is 90 percent of the curve is shaded, and the lower 90% of the curve is shaded. Um, if you were just at the fifth percentile, that would be like right here, and you would shade just the bottom 5% of the curve. But here we're at the 90th percentile, so uh, we expect it to be quite high. And because what we want is below the curve, we use which calculator function? Inverse norm. And so inverse norm takes in area to the left. We've not used this function yet. Uh, so area to the left should be a number between zero and one and it's going to expect to have a number between 0 and 1 here. Um, and we only have three inputs this time. Um, our second and our third are the mean and the standard deviation that we've been using all along. Uh, so our first two inputs, 90% um, gets converted to area, 0.90, so that we can put 0.90 in here. 
uh, and then our mean of 77 and a half is also labeled on the curve and the only thing again not labeled on the curve is our 11 and a half so we'll go to put this in our calculator and uh, second DISDR to get to the menu option 3 for inverse norm and then I'm going to do 0 0.90 uh, 77.5 and 11.5. I'm going to ignore this because you probably don't have this. Um, but if you have yours set on left, um, then it will be just like the way I'm going to go ahead and do it. Um, what this does is it, if we had 10% to the right and I put 0.10 here and selected right, it would give us the same answer. But I'm just going to leave mine on left because if you don't have these options, then by default you have left selected. So to be similar to your calculator, I'm going to pretend I don't have that row and always leave it on left. And I get a score of 92.2. So if I scored 92.2 on the exam, I am at the 90th percentile for the course, on that exam at least. And then, last but not least, we will go to the problem that we had at the very beginning where we ask ourselves what percentage of women are less than 69 inches tall. And so we already have the curve drawn for us here. We will go to 69 inches, um, 6, 9 inches. Um, we have our mean of 65 inches, um, and we are shading all of this area, and we want to know this, but we want to know it as percentage, so of course we're going to do 100 times, um, and then we'll, which calculator function will we use? Um, hopefully you said normal CDF, so we'll do normal CDF. Um, and I'll just kind of walk us through that as we actually put it into the calculator. So I'm going to do my 100 times and then second DISDR, option 2 for normal CDF. And I do want negative 1899 actually because um, I would go forever in this direction. And then uh, my upper is actually 69, uh, if you can remember the picture that I had. And then my mean is uh, 65, it's written right there. And my standard deviation is three and a half. And when I plug all this in, I will get the answer to the question. Before we'd estimated using the empirical rule, and we added 16% to 68% to get 84%. Um, now we know because we did it not to 88 and a half, but all the way, or not to 68 and a half, but to 69 inches. Um, now we know that's actually 87.3, not just 84, but 87.3. So that half inch gave us. 3.3, um, so that's a pretty significant change. Uh, so now we can much more precisely answer our questions on things like these. And so now, as you go into your discussions and your homework and the projects and the quizzes, you can use the same tools that you've always been using. Your formula card will give you the calculator functions, and also under Chapter 2, it'll give you the z-score formula. Your calculator will work those calculator functions for you, and it'll do the arithmetic of the z-score formula. Be sure to use parentheses around any complicated numerators or denominators, and your z-score formula will always have a complicated numerator. Uh, and then your lecture notes that you've used and taken notes on top of during this video, uh, the textbook and the Newton instruction. Um, also, of course, we have the Draw Me a Picture document that you can use on your discussions and your homework and your projects to do your pictures. And then uh, message me if all of those together still aren't getting you the answer that you want. Uh, so good luck in this chapter. I would say that this chapter is, I probably should have said this at the beginning, this chapter is one of the most critical chapters that you will do in this course because chapter 7 depends enormously on nailing chapter 6. So if you don't learn chapter 6 now, you'll have to learn it for chapter 7 because chapter 7 is enormously like chapter 6. And then chapters 8 and 9 build on what you learn in chapters 6 and 7. Uh, so it is very crucial that you get this chapter and get it well, get it nailed down, and then that will help you tremendously in chapters 7, 8, and 9. So I very much wish you good luck in this chapter, and again, message me anytime you have any questions.